Well, hello there, and welcome to the first In Conservation With of 2023. God, life is just streaming on, but we've had so many great people on In Conservation With, and we're continuing that uh, tradition with our guest tonight, who goes by the name of Mike Unwin. Um, now, Mike, you may not have heard of, but you should have done because he's written a ton of books and he's actually going to be talking about his newest book, his latest book now. But before we actually get into that, let me quickly say um, a couple of words for our sponsors. Um, tonight is sponsored by Leica Sport Optics and also by CJ Wildlife. And they are a team of passionate nature lovers and experts in garden wildlife on a mission um, to make nature accessible for everyone, uh, whether you are a nature novice or a garden guru, they will ins they want to inspire and educate and provide the right tools to help wildlife thrive right in your doorstep. So that's CJ Wildlife. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Well, Mike, Happy New Year. How are you? And where are you? I, uh, I'm very well, thank you. Um, bar a slight cold and cough that seems to be going around so uh, i'll try not to make this around the, the, the around the, the bird the, around the world in 80 colds maybe or around the around the cold in 80 birds i don't know anyway i will keep the coughing to a minimum i'm i'm here in brighton um and we've had the first sunny day of the new year so so things are looking up yeah i've been hearing it's been pretty blustery down in the, on the south coast of the uk recently extremely extremely and rainy yeah uh, so yeah, not uh, not not the ideal condition for birds, but maybe ideal conditions for sitting at home and reading about them. Exactly, and watching this Zoom as well. well I'm actually yeah. I'm actually in southwest Spain in Extremadura, and as much as it sounds very lovely and sunny and hot, in fact, it's been quite rainy and chilly as well. And I think I've caught something myself actually. But that's enough of the weather report. Um, we're going to move straight on to our tonight's subject around the world in eighty birds. But before that. Mike, I've never met you, but I've read, I've known about you for many years. And in fact, and we spoke about this earlier, in fact, I first came across you when I first stepped foot into Serbia some 13 or 14 years ago, thinking that I was the original person from the UK to step into Serbia and to watch all this wonderful wildlife and the fun, find owls and stuff like that until someone tumped me in the shoulder and said, Mike Unwin's already been here. <laughs> yeah well interesting that was my first ever trip as a freelance wildlife journalist and I have to admit I didn't really know what I was doing and I had very few expectations and I had an amazing time um, as I'm sure you did as well and um, although it was a bit chaotic a bit disorganized and we were charging around uh, to visit what I were, was promised were exciting bird reserves and a lot of them seemed to be hunting reserves and they were astonished to see people with binoculars and, and not rifles um but uh, no it was an it was an education and um and it and it got me some beautiful birds as well i think my first uh, saker falcon and um a whole lot of other stuff as well so yeah good good memories i should have clearly i should have planted a flag of some kind and claimed it and then <laughs> well, <it's laughs> like the antarctic or whatever but yeah the funny thing is they still speak highly of you now the people who organized that particular tour because i worked with them for several years afterwards and uh, yeah, they, they've spoke very highly. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you go to some of the nature reserves, particularly in the past, maybe now they begin to understand this difference. And you'd be given a brochure and you'll open up the brochure and it's all about that particular nature reserve. You're going through the pages and all of a sudden there's a hunting section. <laughs> and it's yes. about all the stuff you've been looking at or yeah. hoping to find that now could be shot, you know. So yeah. it was uh, quite a, a juxtaposition that I wasn't that comfortable with. But I think. I think things hopefully are changing slightly somewhat. Now, you're I think, not- I think for me, also I would say, as it was one of those wonderful things I, I love to do when traveling, which is I went with no expectations, really. I had no list to tick off. There were, there were no must get birds. I was in the hands of someone I just met and I'd be taken around and whatever I saw, I saw, and whatever <laughs> I ate, I ate. So everything was a bonus. And, and uh, you know, those, those, those opportunities are increasingly rare when, when things come prescribed with lists and agendas and itineraries now. And um, so, yeah, I look back on it fondly. Yeah, I, I, I agree with your, the, your way of looking at stuff, actually, because I like to travel that way too. Even when I do get lists, I tend not to look at them. 
But anyway, um, you're not uh, just a birder, you are a naturalist. Um, can you tell us about some of the work you've done previously, just to give people a background on you? Well, I, I should probably say I'm, a, I'm neither a, a, a birder nor a naturalist. I'm, I'm a fraud and I probably pretend to be both. <laughs> what, what I am is that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a qualified naturalist. I am an extremely enthusiastic wildlife nut and have been since childhood, but I never uh, took this to sort of any academic extent. Um, so it's, it's a passion and, you know, like all passions, you pursue it probably more keenly than you do a job sometimes. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, I, I, I'm, I write books for children, for adults. I, I enjoy writing for the non-experts. I enjoy bringing people, um, into, into the world of, of, of wildlife and, and enthusing them and answering their questions and anticipating what they'll want to know and, and getting them engaged Ra rather, it's sometimes more satisfying than preaching to the converted, I think. Um, and it, it's all sorts. I, I, it's interesting because, um, birds have always been a passion but that's because if you grow up in this country as i might say later they're they're the most conspicuous wildlife around you know so like like every child who's passionate about wildlife i grew up dreaming of you know polar bears and pythons and great white sharks and whatever but what i was in fact doing was trying to what i could see from my window were, were green finches and, and great tits and um so that was my that was my portal that was my entry into into the world of wildlife um, and I've stuck with it, but I've um, expanded it. Um, and I spent quite a lot of time living and working in Southern Africa. And uh, not as a naturalist, I was a teacher, I worked in publishing, but the effect of moving to this incredibly rich environment um, was to broaden my, my focus in a way that I'd never imagined. Suddenly everything was new, everything, there was prolific biodiversity of all kinds. And I was, I was discovering things on my own terms. I, I didn't have a bunch of naturalist friends or birder friends. I was out there grubbing around in the bush, trying to learn what I could in my free time. And uh, that's really the most exciting thing for me. I think discovery, going with people who are discovering things. And, and now as, as a writer, I worked in publishing, but as a writer, what I hope I can do is, is infuse and engage and, and make make all this subject matter and, and science to demystify it, make it accessible to the, the lay person, the interested enthusiast of, of whatever age, because yeah. that's who I was. That's where I started. Yeah, I think you and I are very similar. In fact, we're both frauds as well. I mean, I'm a fraud as well. I'm not, uh, <clears throat> I have no qualifications whatsoever in what I do, but it's about enthusiasm and it's about talking and getting people engaged as well. Uh, as a nature writer, it, I mean, again, this is a question I often ask, what advice would you give people who want to indulge in that? Because it always, I mean, before I even thought about writing anything, I was reading nature books thinking, wow, I mean, you know, someone has spent years, you know, working on this book or whatever. How do you, how do you sustain yourself in, in this market in terms of actually, you know, getting out there and, and getting yourself heard? Well, Good question. Do you mean how do you sustain yourself in terms of bread on the table? <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously no, that's, that's really, one thing, but I'm talking about actually how do you get yourself yeah. seen and heard? I, I think um, you look for opportunities, contexts in which people turn to nature. And in my case, I've done quite a lot of travel writing um, because travel has given me opportunities to return to parts of the world I know, such as Southern Africa, and write about places um, where I have some knowledge. Um, people often discover nature, I think, um, this is a great generalization, but in another context, they, they go on holiday, perhaps they go on safari to Africa, they've never looked for wildlife before, but because you're in Africa, like, like if you go to India, you want to see the Taj Mahal. If you go to Africa, you want you, know, you want to see a lion and elephant because you've seen it on Big Cat Diary. It's official. It's the they, these are the greatest hits. So you're suddenly looking. You're in looking mode for the first time. You've borrowed a pair of binoculars. You someone's got a field guide, and of course there aren't lions and elephants around every corner. It's not like Big Cat Diary. It's you know, but there might be a, a lilac-breasted roller on that next bush. Um, 
or there might be a, a chameleon crossing the road or and because you are officially tuned in you're looking you're, this is what you're meant to be doing you pay attention in a way perhaps that you wouldn't have done back home um and it's a revelation everything becomes interesting everything's fascinating you look at a page of a book oh so that's a line of, well why isn't it that roller ah because that's not here at this time of year well what do you mean well, that's a European roller, they migrate. Okay, so why is it not that one? Well, look at the length of the tail. And, and there's this process of, of engagement and identification that's come through another interest. And I've known so many people when I, when I lived in Southern Africa. I mean, this is maybe a, a sort of, it, of course, it doesn't have to be as somewhere as, as, as glamorous and distant as that. But I just remember that process of people being almost obliged to pay attention um, and it planting the seeds of an interest, which they then took back home with them. And before you knew it, they were putting up feeders in their back garden. Yeah. Um, so, oh. um, so, yeah. So um, it's 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 uh, it, it's interesting how how people come to something and how they pursue it. Yeah. Well, your book "Around the World in Eighty Birds," I was mesmerised by. It's the sort of book I'd love to have written. Um, it's filled with all these really fascinating facts. And it's written in a way that, as you say, it's educational, it's not talking down to the audience, it's actually saying, come, check, check this out. You know, this is what this, this bird's about. And I, I love that. And I think, um, I think now's a good opportunity, actually, um, for us to, to, uh, to delve into your world in this book through your presentation so that people know what we're talking about here. Lovely. Well, I will... Um... Let me share the screen and uh, I can show you a little bit about it. Beautiful. Here we go. Yeah. Lovely. Well, there's the uh, there's the cover of the book, as you can see. Um, I'll hold it up here. <laughs> Around the world in 80 birds. Um, as I was saying, uh, why? All right. Why, why 80 birds? I'd, First of all, it, it's always struck me when looking at the bird book section of a bookshop or a library or the natural history section, there are more books about birds than anything else. More books are sold in publishing about birds than about any other taxonomic groups of, of, of animals, plants, and so on. And I think there are, there are many reasons. The bird, birds are colorful, they're in your face, they're absolutely everywhere. As I was saying, when I grew up in this country, um, they were the most conspicuous, most obvious form of wildlife. Um, and so, I mean, I can give you the figures that it's, you know, there's whatever, 11,000 or so species of bird in the world, and they're in every possible habitat there, you know, from, from the, the, the pack ice to the tropical rainforest to the, our city centers and, and so on. Um, but it, it's not just about their, their numbers, it's the fact that they are, they're so conspicuous, um, they're around us wherever we go. I think I, I live in the in the middle of Brighton, and um, I'm not in a nature reserve by any means. My garden is a tiny little uh, tiny little patch of suburbia or of of, of of city, in fact. But I worked out within an average day, I'm going to come across about 25 species of bird, one form or another. You know, whether it's the gulls uh, passing my window or the wren in the back garden, um, or the, the jay on my walk around the local crematorium that's where I get my greenery or it's the birds I encounter on the spines of books or on people's tattoos or on the logos and what have you they are absolutely everywhere so we develop um, a relationship with them and uh, this book therefore it's not so much a book it's, it's not a field guide it's not to tell you how to identify birds um, it's not a lovely coffee table gallery full of photographs and so on, although it's beautifully illustrated, I should say, by the wonderful Ryoto Miyaki, who has produced all those, those illustrations that you see spread around the, the, the cover there. Um, and I'll show you a few of them here if you want to. Um, yes, you can see. So it's, it's lavishly illustrated. Um, but this is about a book about our relationship with birds. Um, and I've chosen 80 birds, and each bird in the book uh, represents a particular country or a part of the world where it finds um, a special significance. Um, and uh, 
I've described each of those species in terms of their relationship with us, with, with humankind. Um, and choosing 80, I have to say, was a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> I could very easily have chosen 80 others and 80 beyond that. And I'm sure you could, David, and I'm sure everyone else could too. And if it gets people talking and if, uh, if people are outraged by the fact I found no space for a peregrine falcon or a peacock or I mean there's no woodpecker in the book there's no heron species in the book I know this is this is criminal but then you know you see what else is in there and what else I've left out but uh, but choosing those 80 the idea was to give through them um, an idea of the extraordinary diversity of birds in the world and uh, the many different ways in which we relate to them, uh, what birds mean to us and why they've captured our imaginations and, and, and achieved such significance in our lives. Um, and there are, let's, let's move on, shall we? There are many different criteria um, for the birds that are significant. Here, I'll start. This is, yeah, I'm sure some of you recognize this. The, these are battler eagles. It's uh, a bird of prey found in much of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and this is the national bird of Zimbabwe. Um, and I should say, not all the 80 birds in the book are national birds. That would have been uh, easy to do, uh, but it would have given me an awful lot of birds of prey because <laughs> eagles, with all their associations with sort of power and military might and, and, and nobility and so on, our eagles tend to be national birds all over the place. The, I think the golden eagle is a national bird of six countries, the fish eagle is a national bird of two countries, the Philippine eagle is the national bird of the Philippines and so on. But this one fascinates me because if you look in this picture, in the background, you see that circular wall off in the bush there. That's, that, those are the ruins of Great Zimbabwe. And if you know your, your history of Southern Africa, um, before I think Zimbabwe became, became dependent properly, independent in, in 1980. And um, before that, it had, been, uh, it had been Rhodesia, and before that, Southern Rhodesia. So it had been a colony, it had been a European colony. And um, integral to the, the, the rationale of the colonists, the, the Europeans who, who were in Africa at that time, was, was, was the, the thought that they were bringing civilization that, you know, to, this, um, to this rather kind of untamed, savage land, all, those, all that kind of European mythology about Africa. And when they discovered these extraordinary ruins in the center of the country that's now Zimbabwe, they, no one wanted to accept the fact that they were, had been built by a pre-European sophisticated civilization. In fact, the civilization, the Monomotapa, who were the ancestors of today's Shona people. Uh, and all sorts of theories were, were put out to um, explain uh, these ruins, they were, they were thought to have been built, perhaps claimed they were built by Phoenicians and by Arabs and so on, anything but, but a, a, an indigenous African society. And um, this was taught in the colonial history books. But the history is fascinating because when the, when the first European explorer found these ruins, it was a German, I forget his name, um, Willy, somebody, he, it was in 1822, I think. Um, no, 1889, I beg your pardon, as recently as that, 1889. Willy Posselt, and he, he stumbled into these ruins and he followed these enormous thick granite walls until he reached an inner chamber. And in this chamber were eight beautiful carved figurines, each representing a bird. Um, these are what they look like. And uh, did he leave them there? Of course he didn't, he ransacked them. And these, these figurines were dispersed all over the world. I think one ended up in South Africa, a couple in Germany and so on. Um, and we now know that these almost certainly were carvings of the Battler Eagle, um, the bird I've just shown you, which had a totemic significance um, to the Manamatapa people of that time. It was seen to be carrying messages because of course, like many birds of prey, it, it soared enormous distances on, on those, those long wings, about five, 500 kilometers a day is known. Um, and so the, the ruins were ransacked, these carved figurines were taken away. And um, in 1980, when Zimbabwe finally became independent and declared its, its new name, Zimbabwe, no longer Rhodesia, it adopted this bird, um, the, the Zimbabwe bird, as its national symbol. And today you'll find it in the center of the Zimbabwean flag, 
Uh, you'll find it on the banknotes. You'll find it in emblematic form all over the place. And it is the battler eagle. Um, so it shows that a bird species can embody the, the, the pride, the self-determination of, of, of an entire nation. Um, here we go again. That's a photograph, my photograph that's taken um, in Zimbabwe. A, a lovely bird. In fact, um, ornithologists will know that it's, it's related to the, uh, the snake eagles, the Circaetus snake eagles. It has a very distinct short tail. Um, and you can see in that picture the long wingtips that protrude below the branch well beyond the tail. Um, lovely bird, a, a very colourful for an eagle, a kind of harlequin plumage. Um, sadly, like many big raptors, it's, it's very threatened now in, in, in Africa, it doesn't really breed outside reserves or, or is scarce. Um, but I always think of it as, as somehow being embodying the, 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 the self-determination of a nation. And uh, by the way, a nice little field tip for anyone in Africa, this bird is, uh, is a very good clue to finding leopards because it soars at a very low height. Um, it's often first to, because it, it feeds on, on carrion, it scavenges as well as taking live prey. And uh, so by gliding just above treetop level, it will quite often find a treed leopard kill, an impala or something hoisted into a branch. And so if you see a, a, a battler eagle perched just below the canopy in a, in a tree, quietly, have a look around and you may find in the tree next door that there's a leopard on the kill. That's my little bit of, of bush law for you. Um, anyway, that's enough about uh, battler eagles. What else have we got? Oh, another one. I'm still in Africa. I used to live in uh, Eswatini. Um, used to be called Swaziland when I was there. I lived there five years. Um, this bird, you may or may not know, it's, it's a turaco. It's the purple crested turaco. Um, it's in, in uh, Siswati, the language of Eswatini, it's called the uh, Liguala Guala. Um, and uh, like, like all Turacos, which it's uh, the, the Musa Fagadai, they're an exclusively African family of birds, has beautiful plumage um, and a rather ugly call. The Liguala Guala is its, uh, I don't know if you heard one, it's a, it's a kind of, what, uh, the advantage of not being able to whistle like me is I, I can only reproduce bird calls that don't involve whistling. And this one <laughs> is a kind of, <laughs> There you are. <laughs> so for anyone who knows Southern Africa, you hear that call, you'll know it's a Liguala Guala, but they're incredibly hard to spot. Uh, they, they skulk around in the, uh, the canopy of um, fruiting fig trees, typically. Um, but why have I got it here? It's, it's another bird that has a national significance. The Liguala Guala is the national bird of, of Eswatini. Tiny little country, but very traditional, still an absolute monarchy. If you don't know it, look down at the, the bottom right hand corner of the map of Africa and it's almost completely surrounded by South Africa. Um, and the Liguala Guala, its feathers, those red flight feathers you see there are traditionally they denote royalty. And to this day, they are worn uh, in the hairdos, the headdresses of members of the royal family. And, and the, uh, the Swaziland or the Eswatini royal family is very large because uh, the last king reputedly had uh, over 500 children. Now, I'm not sure if <laughs> yeah, a great number of wives, whether that's ever been proven, I don't know. But I took this photograph at the uh, independence celebrations, the 40 years of independence celebrations in Swaziland a few years ago, and everyone was decked out in their, in their finery, uh, dressing up in traditional dress for the occasion. And this is one of the, uh, the royal princesses, um, the, the, the young woman in the middle, one of the uh, Emma Kozigati, the princesses. And you can see uh, the feathers she's wearing in her hair and in the guy behind her and uh, the woman below her, those are the primary wing feathers of the purple crested Turaco, um, which is, is nice for the Turaco to get a little bit of recognition like that, uh, not so nice in that they are still harvested for these feathers. Um, so there is a potential conservation problem there. Um, anyway, we'll move on. Jump continent, here's a strange one. Um, this is the uh, sword-billed hummingbird. We're now in South America. And this I have um, assigned to the country of Ecuador. Um, in fact, I could have assigned it to one or two other countries in the South American Andes. Um, where hummingbirds are 
uh, one of the jewels, almost almost literally, of the of the avian crown. Um, but the sword bill you can see is pretty extraordinary. It's the only bird in the world that has a bill that's more than half the length, uh, more than half its entire length. And uh, as you can see in this in this illustration, it actually has to um, it has to tilt its head upwards at its roost, otherwise it will it will spin over um, by the, due to the entire the size and weight of its bill. And uh, I, I put this in to show that uh, in the as much as we're attracted to birds and they assume significance often for their beauty that so you know that the feathers of the turaco um you know and we think of golden pheasants and we think of uh, birds of paradise and various other spectacularly colorful birds um that i have in my book but some of them catch our eye and fire our imaginations because they're just plain bizarre um and uh all hummingbirds are extraordinary. They're, they're, they lead these high octane lives. They zip around um, heartbeats, uh, heart rates of over a thousand beats a minute. Some of them um, beating their wings faster than a bee. They they have to feed every few hours, otherwise they'll perish. Um, they are the most extraordinary creatures, um, but none more extraordinary than this. Uh, but then, what is bizarre? Uh, this is not something to entertain us, this bill. This is something that evolution has produced. It's an adaptation of the bird, um, enabling it to, to feed in a very specific way. Now, all, all hummingbirds, as, as I'm sure you know, feed um, on nectar that they take from flowers. Um, and each has adapted to a particular flower, um, its bill length suiting the, the corolla. And in this case, the sword-billed hummingbird um, is able to reach where um, other hummingbirds can't go, to, to paraphrase an old advert. Um, these, these are the, the flowers of the Passiflora mista, um, and the hummingbird feeds on these, penetrating deep and uh, obtaining nectar in that way with this incredibly long bill and, and the tongue that emerges on a, on a groove. And it follows a regular feeding pattern, moving from flower to flower and therefore pollinating them in the process. Um, so it is really rather wonderful. Um, but to see the bizarre and the wonderful, you don't need to go to the Andes in South America. Here is the swift, and I've included the swift in my book, the common swift, the Eurasian swift, as a species for our country, for the UK. And in doing so, I wanted to make the point that uh, well, yes, you don't have to go to the ends of the earth to see the bizarre and that really extraordinary things are happening right under our noses. The, the swift to me, we talk about the, the sound of summer in Britain. We, we talk about it being heralded by the cuckoo or, um, or, or various other perhaps more lyrical birds. Um, for me, swift, when swifts arrive, that they're the last of the African migrants to arrive in the UK. Um, early May usually, and they have this extraordinary scream and they hurtle around our rooftops. Um, in, in plumage terms, they're nothing much to look at, a kind of, uh, a kind of sooty uh, blackish brown. Um, but when you learn about their lives, uh, it, it's quite mind-boggling. Um, and in fact, what we know about the lives of Swifts has been pioneered uh, in this country. There was a, a famous book, Swifts in the Tower, um, written by um, David and Elizabeth Lack, in, based on Swifts in, in Oxford. And Swifts have always been associated, well, for thousands of years at least, going back to Sumerian times, with nesting in, in human habitation. Um, they can't, they have such tiny feet that, um, uh, that they can't walk. They can, they can only really cling to vertical surfaces where they nest. Um, and so high buildings, church steeples, towers, and so on suit them, and that's where they've been studied. And the more we've studied them, the more we've learned, the more astonishing they are. Um, these are birds that are so aerial. Um, it's almost as though if they, if they, if it wasn't for the tiresome necessity of, 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 of breeding, the fact that you can't lay an egg in midair, you have to put it on some kind of surface, these birds would no more need to touch down, uh, really, than, than, than a fish would need to leave the water. They, 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 they feed on the wing, on, on the aerial plankton of insects and spiders. They drink on the wing. They gather nest material. They mate. They sleep. Um, and modern tracking has enabled us to discover that young birds, because they fledge in this country, um, and the first thing they have to do is migrate to Africa, 
where they'll spend a couple of years maturing before they reach sexual maturity and can return and breed again, these young birds may not touch down at all in that time. So we're talking about a bird. Uh, this is a, a warm blooded uh, living, breathing creature with a, a brain and a heart and a respiratory system and all those things we associate with, uh, with, with land living creatures. Uh, it can go 18 months at least in the air without touching a solid surface. Um, and it's, it's hard to get our heads around this. Um, so yeah, we don't have to go uh, far from home and we can stay at home to, to see the astonishing in the bird world. And I often think that uh, we do the bird world a disservice by always selecting the most supposedly noble or beautiful or colorful as our emblems. Um, because if we want, creatures to represent uh, impressive values then it, uh, the swift really kind of takes the cake um here's another another european african migrant an afro-paleoctic migrant this is a bird not known for its colors you can see it's it's actually it's quite dull it's a nightingale um it's known for its song and uh, that's another thing. I've chosen some birds in this book, not for their appearance, um, but for the noises they make. And the nightingale is probably the most uh, celebrated songster of all, of all the UK birds. Um, and it intrigues me and it amuses me, the, the values that we, we heap on birdsong. Um, of course, we know the Shakespeare uh, that we know Nightingale from Shakespeare and, and, and Keats. Um, and in this case, I've, I've chosen the Nightingale to represent France um, because it goes back to very early French folklore. There are a lot of French nursery rhymes um, that talk about nightingales. One of the first French poems um, recorded talks about the Laustique, which is the, the Nightingale song. Um, and in this case, there's a, there's, a, there's a nursery rhyme, a famous nursery rhyme in which the, the nightingale is pining for, a, for a, or, or lamenting a, the betrayal by a lover. And uh, it talks about the les hommes ne valent rien, which essentially is men, men are worthless. Um, but the association with romance and lyricism and all those values of a nightingale is, is, <laughs> is very far from what's actually happening here biologically um the nightingale like any singing bird is in fact uh it's not pining for a lost love it, it's uh it's not generating beautiful poetry it's belting out its territorial song it's claiming a patch it, it's driven by by territorial imperative and and by sexual urgency it's it's trying to catch a mate um and i think the fact that it does it at night is one of the few songbirds that will sing at night um is uh, what has elevated it in our imaginations because as the rest of the world falls quiet, this melody, which is a very odd melody, it's beautiful in some respects, it's harsh in other respects, it has a great deal of volume, but that volume is accentuated by the silence around it, of course, and which is why it, it's, it's worked its way into the dreams and, and the thoughts of poets over the years. And it, it does intrigue me actually how different cultures bring different values to to birds and to bird song and i and the way that bird song has come to represent is to come to be a, a shorthand for particular ideas and values in our society and they're often they're often quite uh misleading in terms of what's really going on but we 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 if you play a the soundtrack to any period drama and a, and a, a couple of lovers disappear into a thicket you'll hear the song of a nightingale just in the same way as in any spooky horror movie, uh, and as someone enters a forest or a dark house, you'll hear the hoot of a tawny owl. Um, tawny owl has come to, to uh, represent um, the mysterious and the sinister and the dark and, and the threat. Um, and uh, it, 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 it amuses me that even if you are listening to uh, such a scene in an American movie, you will sometimes hear um, a European tawny owl hooting, although that bird's not found in America at all. Um, just as, <laughs> here's another one. This is uh, what's known in North America as the common loon, um, what we call the great northern diver. 
in Britain. Um, and this is the, it's the state bird of Ontario in Canada. And I've given, I've assigned this bird to Canada um, in my book. And this bird has become, it's called cool, a wonderful sort of tremolo. I can't really reproduce it. It's not a Liguala Guala, unfortunately. Um, if you've ever seen the film On Golden Pond, it, it features there with Catherine Hepburn. She actually tries to uh, imitate the bird. But it's so uh, suggestive now of, of wilderness, of a sort of romanticized, lonely wilderness, um, that you'll hear it used all over the place. I've heard this, the call of the, the common loon used in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And um, most amusingly recently, the film 1917, um, when the, uh, the young lads are entering the trenches as Sam Mendes, I think it was Sam Mendes' film? Yes. Um, that celebrates a long take and they from behind the lines they they wander into the trenches until they're in uh, enemy territory and it all becomes very foreboding and, and bleak and at some point deep, <laughs> deep in the winter trenches uh, of, uh, of Belgium you hear the breeding call of a common loon recorded on some lake in Canada and that makes me to be out to be the absolute bird nerd and I didn't stand up in the cinema I, I promise um but it's just interesting that that call has become the universal soundtrack of of, um, of wilderness, as I say. The bird itself is uh, is, is a gorgeous bird. Um, we get them here in the UK as as winter visitors and around the the, the western coast of Europe. Um, they the closest they breed to us is Iceland. There's a photo I've taken of one um, where we see them. They're not in their gorgeous colours, but this is a bird that has enormous um, cultural significance in in North America and. Uh, many of the First Nations peoples uh, saw it as a, as, um, as, as a divine figure. It was bound up with creation myths. That the wonderful spangly plumage that you can see, those going back, those uh, white spangles on the back were seen as a necklace that was bestowed upon the, the, the northern loon, the common loon, um, because it brought the gift of sight to a, to a medicine man. And this was something believed by many different uh, indigenous communities. Um, and yes, it lives on freshwater lakes, visits us in winter. Uh, and that bill, by the way, I had an extraordinary story, which I included in my book. Um, these are far from defenseless birds. They're large birds, size of a goose. Um, there was a record of about four years ago, 2018, I think, of a bald eagle, massive predator, uh, that was actually killed by one of these uh, common loons, great northern divers. Uh, when swooping in because they'll ride with their chicks on their back when they're young and the, 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 the eagle was having a go trying to snatch one of the chicks and was found dead um, with a penetrating wound to its chest from the bill of the loon. So uh, yeah, never underestimate a, a diver. Let's move on. Uh, okay, here we go. What's this? Any, any, <laughs> any bird buffs identify this one? Um, it's an owl and in fact it's a, it's a little owl and this is a uh, a painting by uh, Ryoto of the ancient one drachma coin that was discovered more than uh, five, about 500 BC in ancient Greece. And it tells us that the little owl, um, which we have in Britain today, in fact, as, as an introduced bird, and but is common around the Mediterranean, it was, it was also afforded a sacred significance in, in ancient Greece. Um, and uh, in fact, it is set in, in 2002, when Greece joined the Eurozone, the one drachma coin was no more, but the little owl uh, hopped across onto the, uh, the, the Greek Euro note. So it's still preserved in, in the iconography of, of, of Greece. Um, yeah, and owls, it's interesting. Owls, I think, again, they have these forward facing eyes, which give them a very penetrating gaze. And they have their eyes surrounded by these facial discs uh, which are in fact to amplify hearing, but there's something about that that gives them an expression um, that we as humans interpret in various ways. And that combined with these nocturnal noises, and they're not all hoots, some owls shriek and some whistle and some chirp. Um, uh, they've elevated them into, into uh, birds of great significance. And it's interesting in this country though, we, we think of owls, uh, they're associated with wisdom, wise old owl, um, all sorts of folklore tells you that. But if you go to Africa, Owls are far from that. They're seen as, as sinister. Um, bad, bad luck um, will befall you should an owl fly over your house in the evening in many traditional societies. Um, so yeah, it's each to their own culturally. We all bring what seems most significant to us to the, to the birds that we live with. There's a little owl. 
small owl catching a mouse, but a, um, uh, no, really not much larger than a, a, a chubby starling, um, but a, a rapacious little bird. It's been known to catch uh, baby rabbits. So look out for these sitting on fence posts. Another extraordinary bird. Uh, we, we, we were in ancient Greece. I'll stay in ancient Greece. This is the bearded vulture. Um, and actually this, I have given this as the bird for Spain. Um, and in Spain, well, you'll know this, David, um, it, it, it's known in Spanish as quebranto huesos. Um, you might have to correct me if I've, I've mispronounced that, but it literally means the breaker of bones. And, and this is a vulture, but it's unlike any other vulture. It feeds almost entirely on bone marrow. Um, and it obtains this bone marrow by dropping its bones. It carries them up to a height, drops them, they shatter on the rocks below, um, it, and it goes down and swallows in great chunks. Um, the pieces of bone marrow, which its, it's formidable stomach acids can digest very quickly. Um, and I've seen this bird in various parts of the world. I've seen it in, uh, I've actually seen one almost on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, um, which is one of the most knackering bird sightings I've ever <laughs> experienced. Um, I've seen them in South Africa, I've seen them in Spain. Um, but uh, I mentioned ancient Greece, the Greek playwright Aeschylus, writer of Oedipus Rex and other classics, um, historians will tell you, uh, met his demise when a bird dropped a tortoise on his head, um, which has to be unfortunate by any standards. Um, but I'd like to think, and some have speculated, that uh, maybe this isn't a myth, and maybe the bird that did it was a quebrantoesos, a bearded vulture, um, because what it does with bones, it also does with tortoises. So uh, poor old Iskira got in the way. Um, right, let's move on. Another one. Um, I'm just going to check the time, see how we're doing here. Right, I better. I think I better. I better speed up. Five. Um, here, another Spanish bird you'll know well, um, David, the white stork. Um, but another thing about birds is how they have been for us a portal into science. We learnt about a bird migration to some extent through this bird. Now, if I, if I talk about the white stork and culture, you'll think of, of baby carriers of legend or perhaps um, as pilgrims to Mecca um, in Islam. But uh, there was an incredible, incredible story. In, in 1822, a white stork, which is a migratory bird, turned up in Germany, and it's Germany, to which I've assigned this bird in the book, turned up with a arrow through its neck. Um, miraculously, it seemed to be functioning perfectly well, but this large arrow was protruding through its neck, um, and it nested on top of a building, um, made this big nest on, on a tower, as white storks are wont to do. Um, but this uh, one, uh, the stork, whether it died or whether it more likely was shot, collected, shall we say, is a euphemism. Um, but when it was recovered, this arrow turned out to be of African origin, which astonished the scientists at the, at the time. How on earth had this uh, bird turned up with an African arrow through its neck? Um, and it was known as, uh, I, I don't speak German, but I think the term is Feilstorch. Uh, it was in the town of um, Klutz in Germany. And this original specimen is now preserved in the museum um, at Rostock. Um, amazingly, another 25 foul stalkers have been recorded. Um, and this was the first tangible evidence to scientists at the time that birds migrated from northern Europe to sub-Saharan Africa, and they did it every year. There were all kinds of outlandish theories were being touted around uh, about swallows migrating at the bottom of ponds, uh, sorry, my, uh, hibernating at the bottom of ponds and so on. Um, but, and this was, it wasn't until 1912 um, that the first swallow was ringed and we knew they went to South Africa. So this was uh, nearly a century before that. Um, so birds have been a window into science for us. Um, here we go. This is a photograph I took in Zambia. Those are white storks massing um, before a storm front, ready to return to Europe. Um, some of them, I'd like to hope, uh, ended up in Germany. And um, I'd equally like to hope none of them arrived with arrows through the next. Um, but yeah, we learned about 
uh, migration um, through birds. And of course, not just, it's not just birds that migrate, it's not just a few birds that migrate, it's everything from turtles to humpback whales to monarch butterflies and so on. It's an extraordinary phenomenon. Well, it's not extraordinary, it's absolutely usual now that we understand it. Um, and it was birds that told us about evolution. It was Darwin and his Galapagos finches. It was uh, birds that in recent times alerted us to the dangers of pesticides, studies of uh, peregrine, and, peregrine folk and eggs and, and the dangers of DDT. Um, so there's lots more I could say. I've got more pictures here, but I've been going on rather a long time and I think I should return us to David. But uh, my final message and the thing I say at the end of the book, um, uh, we need birds. We need birds. Um, we need them in our environment. We need them for all their ecosystem services, as a scientist will tell you. But we need them <coughs> for our culture. We need them for our lives. We need them to sustain us. Um, and in return, they need us. And the next, uh, the next section will all have been, have been about rarity. But perhaps uh, we've got a little time to discuss that as well, because some of the birds in my book are there because they have almost disappeared. Okay, let me uh, get out of this and return to your screens. Hello. Mike, thank you. That was fascinating. And, you know, I'm sure we could have all sat here for the rest of the evening because each of these birds have such fascinating stories. Um, and by the way, just as an aside, um, Dennis was asking about the little owl um, and they were introduced to the UK in apparently 1843 or actually maybe before then in Yorkshire. And then that didn't work, so they were introduced again by someone else in Nottinghamshire, I believe. Um, That's right. And then they right. started to spread, and then people started thinking, hang on a minute, gamekeepers thinking they're, they're attacking our chicks and game birds. Yeah. And it wasn't until the 19, 1935 when the British Trust for Ornithology did some work, a survey and study on it, and realised that they actually just eat insects and mammals. Yeah, and, if, and one of the reasons they were so popular in elsewhere in Europe is that they were kept around houses to get rid of cockroaches. So they they, they <laughs> slept very well as, uh, as, uh, as, as pest control in houses in the Mediterranean. And there's one theory that I can't remember who it was, but one of the uh, original characters who introduced them to Britain had that in mind. Well, well, you know what we're going to do? Um, we've got a Q&A coming up after this main event. And maybe we can continue your 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 um, presentation because I'll be interested to, uh, I'm sure everyone else would be interested in hearing about the rarities part of this because it's very fascinating. But looking through the list of birds in this book, by the way, I can just hold it up again because when you held it up before, there you go. That better? Yeah, beautiful cover, by the way. Beautiful. Isn't it lovely? I should say that all the images on the cover are taken from the inside of the book. So uh, uh, congratulations to the designer for managing to arrange them in such an ingenious way. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I knew all of the species that you mentioned, and by knowing them, I meant, you know, at least I've heard of them, but the Todoroi Bailador, I thought, what the hell is that? Um, yeah. You need to buy the book to see, <laughs> to see this, but... Uh, I was wondering what that was, and I've obviously take, took a look to discover more, and I'm sure you'll tell us very briefly what, what it was. Well, I, I had no idea. I'll show you. Here's a Tororoi bailador. And to those of you who know your neotropical birds, um, it's, its name translates roughly as the dancing ant pitter. So it's a species of ant pitter, which is a family of small, uh, South American birds that feed on the forest floor. Um, and it's interesting because I give this bird, this bird in my book represents Colombia. And Colombia actually has the most, the, the, the greatest number of species recorded of any country in the world. I think close to 2000, 1970 species. I'm sure people are arguing as, as we speak about the precise number. Um, and probably <laughs> I've chosen the most obscure. I could have gone for any number of fabulous harpy eagles or toucans or macaws or good spectacular A-list crowd pullers. Um, but the point I wanted to make is this bird was only discovered in um, 2000 and I think 17 or 18. Um, in, in fact, it was thought to be a race of another bird, the very similar Peruvian ant pitter, but a separate population was discovered um, in Colombia. And we now know it to be an entirely new species. And the point I want to make there is that 
we still have an enormous amount to learn. There are new species of birds um, waiting to be identified, perhaps even seen for the first time. Um, we are far from knowing it all. We probably only know a fraction. Um, and But as we are attempting to inform ourselves, so the habitats in which these birds live are disappearing. I mean, the, uh, we all know about the forests of South America. This is a neotropical, a tropical forest bird. Uh, oh, that's the cover. That's the cover. Well, you can see the cover again. Um, uh, but we, we know about the horrendous rate at which the Amazon is disappearing. Um, who knows what we are losing uh, as it disappears? And who knows how many birds are going? And also, what store of knowledge represented in each bird might be disappearing with them? Yeah, so that's, really, why I, that's why I've got it in there. Yeah, it's really fascinating, this whole idea about things disappearing and the fact that things are also being discovered even whilst the habitat's disappearing. I mean, you know, I was talking to you earlier, there's some large animals like the mountain gorilla, the okapi, which yeah. is a giraffe, yeah. um, all being discovered really recently, like late, in fact, the, I think the mountain gorilla was discovered, or maybe the Akapi was discovered in 1904. That's like five yeah. years ago. And yeah. that's a large animal. And yeah. what, I, what I cling on to is a hope that some things are actually rediscovered. I remember reading in your book, I can't remember what species, species it was, but there's a population that was discovered maybe 20 years ago, a particular bird in an area that people thought was extinct. I think Gurney's Pitta, possibly. Well, it's that, that's another one, actually. There's something else. But, oh, there's something else, yeah. yeah. Okay. But it, it kind of gives you hope. Do you, think, do you think there's a lot of stuff out there to be discovered? I mean, people talk about Bigfoot, and it's often the butt of many jokes. And people say, how can it exist? Because no one's ever found any bodies, droppings, hairs, or anything. But then I remember reading about, I think it's the Sumatran tiger, the race in Sumatra, yeah. which was thought to be long extinct. And they've existed, you know, without ever being found, you know, that I yes. think they've recently been discovered, you know, living in Sumatra. So if such a large animal can exist, then yeah. you know, we have a lot to learn. Yeah, there was an entirely new um, ungulate discovered in Vietnam in the, in the late 1980s, the Sciola. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that it's very important for us to accept that knowledge isn't finite. Uh, or that you know that there is an assumption that we live somehow in a post-discovery age now. Everything's been done, and you, we, it's all in the field guides. It's all on the internet. It's all in Wikipedia. And knowledge has been uh, has been conquered. We have it now. We just have to look it up. But we're learning all the time. And um, whether it's actual species, in the case of the ones we've just discussed, or what animals do. Uh, what, how they live, how they interact with each other. Some of the things I was saying about swifts just now, uh, we're still learning about swifts every year. Um, and the, you know, the, the ability to put tiny satellite transmitters on, on tiny migratory birds, or even on dragonflies for that matter. You know, we now know that there's a, uh, the globe skimmer dragonfly travels from um, the Indian subcontinent to East Africa, reproduces and travels across equatorial Africa. These are dragonflies uh, covering thousands of kilometers across the Indian Ocean. And as our technology um, improves, so we learn more. Um, so yeah, there are, there are species out there. I love the idea of that. Of course, of course I do. Um, there's a sort of you know, an expeditionary excitement to the idea that you might go into an uncharted patch of rainforest or, or even turn over a rock on a, on a seashore. And I'm sure that's absolutely true. Um, and we know that with the smaller, smaller um, classes of, of um, organism, things like beetles, we only know a fraction um, of, of, of the total. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, we need to be humble in the face of it. We need to assume... Um, nothing we need to keep our minds open we need to keep looking and we need to keep preserving because otherwise the opportunity to learn will be gone exactly one quick thing before we say nighty night night um i learned a lot from this book reading this book mm. um, and what i found fascinating for example was the the story of the oxpecker oh yeah you think of oxpeckers jumping on the backs of buffaloes and you yeah. know, picking out the parasites out of their ears and stuff like that and the, the buffaloes thinking oh great i'm getting a bit of you know me time here but in reality is something potentially something very different 
in reality, Ox, yeah, I mean, we, you, like me, probably grew up in looking at children's encyclopedias, and the Oxpecker was always the, the classic example of mutualism. It's a you scratch my back, I scratch yours, something in return. So the uh, the Oxpecker gets rid of the parasites on the animal's hide, and um, and it gets a meal, and the animal gets a personal grooming service. But in fact, we now know that oxpeckers feed on blood, and this is actually more of a parasitic than a than a mutual um, beneficial relationship. Um, and uh, so, there's, but there's still a lot of research to be done there. Why do these large mammals still tolerate oxpeckers? Um, there is some service they get from it. So yeah, we and I love these these symbiotic relationships. Um, there's another bird in there. Uh, with I had one of the most extraordinary experiences ever in my bird watching life, which is the Greater Honey Guide. And if I think about my great wildlife moments in Africa, and you know, you can talk about thrills and spills with the big five and so on. But I was once walking, I'll tell you very, very quickly, if we've got time, I was out in the bush in Zambia um, with a guide walking through um, elephant country in Kafui National Park. And I heard this very, um, uh, very frantic chittering call from a tree ahead of us, and it was a, a greater honey guide, uh, which is a bird I know, and I know it's a usual call, but this is what's known as this guiding call. And this is a bird that I read as a child, uh, supposedly will guide people to honey. And what it will do is guide people to a bee's nest. The people break in, climb up, smoke out the bees, remove the honeycomb, and leave some for the bird. But this was always, there was always some debate about this. Um, is this myth? It, it all sounds too perfect. Do they do it with people? Do they do it with honey badgers? But I experienced this. We were walking along a trail. The bird was ch chattering away ahead of us. We reached a fork in the trail. We went right. The bird had gone left. It came back, pursued us, and it was now apoplectic with it. It was, it was chattering and chittering away. And I said to the guide I was with, can, can we just, you know, indulge me? Can we, can we follow this up? So we doubled back. We bent back on our tracks, we took the left-hand fork and the bird now flew ahead of us. A hundred meters called, another hundred meters called. We kept going, we kept going, we kept going. After about 20 minutes, we got to a baobab tree and, in the tr and, and it flew up into the upper branches and it fell silent. Uh, what now? And then I looked at the baobab, there seemed to be smoke coming out of the trunk. And I looked with binoculars, there was a hole in the trunk and there were bees swarming out of the trunk and the, and the, and the bird just sat there. And now our job was, was clear. You know, we were now meant to, uh, I mean, traditional hunter-gatherers have done this for centuries. They've developed a, 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 a mutualistic relationship with a honey guide and they would, they would cut a branch, they would go up the tree, they would stuff uh, smoking brands in, smoke the bees out to dull their stings, pull out the honey. Um, and, and the story goes that you must always leave a little bit because this bird feeds on a honeycomb and on the grubs leave a little bit behind for the bird, because if you don't do that, next time it's going to lead you to a, to a black mamba or something I less palatable. I so, uh, and I saw this in action and we didn't climb up, we didn't get the honey out, but I just thought, wow, uh, yeah, stranger than fiction sometimes. So you better watch out next time one guides you, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you the last thing, the name of this bird in Latin, indicator, indicator, that my favorite species name. Now, talking about favorite species, what is your favorite species? Oh, dear me. Uh, right, I'm going to say black-throated diver. Interesting. If you could be anywhere in the world right now, where would you be? I would be in a small reserve called Malalocha in Eswatini, Swaziland. Sounds good to me. Full of birds uh, and small mammals. Great. Um, before we say goodbye to each other, I just want to quickly tell everyone um, that we have a few more uh, great guests coming on in conservation. We've got a guy called Ian Parsons who's written a book called um, Seasonality, and he's going to be here on Thursday, January the 12th, talking about that. On uh, the 19th of January, we've got a guy called Mike Toms who works for the British Trust for Ornithology, and he's written this or sort of curated the second edition of the uh, the red list unfortunately the red listed birds in the uk so we'll, we'll be talking to him 23rd of january we've got my mate mark height he's from uh, from uh, the netherlands is he's, he's created a new handbook of european birds which on the surface looks like another handbook but in fact the information in this book is incredible did you know for example there's a subspecies 
of reed bunting in Spain, which has a thick bill, and there's only a hundred of them in the world. I didn't know that. Um, on the 26th of January, we've got Dr. Karen Backer, who's written the book about the sounds within nature. And she also wants to talk about whether um, the internet can be a great way of getting people involved in nature. And on the 30th of January, we've got a guy called Arjun, can't pronounce his surname at the moment. He's from the Netherlands as well. He's just been around the world. He's actually the record breaking um, lister, I've seen a ton of species in a year. He's going to tell us what happened and why. So that's what's coming up. If you are a member of the Urban Bird of World community, you can watch the Q&A, which is going to happen now and for all the others um, exclusively, but otherwise this will be on YouTube. And I'd like to thank Mike for sparing your time this evening to give us this fascinating insight, which we'll continue in a minute, on your book, Around the World in 80 Birds. Brilliant. I'm looking forward to meeting you, by the way, Mike, but well done with the book. And Me too. Luck. Thanks so much, David. Delighted to be on. Thank you. And, and Zoomers, thank you very much. Love to, the fact that you're here and supporting In Conservation With. Um, I'll see you right after we say this, which is keep looking up. <laughs>